So we're first of all very grateful for the panelists who have joined us here and have come from afar to uh, discuss with us the future potential of language technologies. I will briefly say their names. Professor Dillman is a colleague of mine here at uh, KIT. Dr. Cencioni is in charge of language technologies of the European uh, Commission and has a long history and uh, experience with managing projects in the European Commission uh, in language technologies. Professor Carbonell is uh, my colleague at Carnegie Mellon University and also the department head of the Language Technology Institute in which uh, Interact is also housed at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Ms. Altenberg, we're also very happy that you made the long trip from the European Parliament. She's engaged in the human aspect of uh, translating speakers in the European Parliament, so she intimately knows about the problems that we're facing. Professor Asfour, another colleague of ours here in uh, KIT, who has participated with us this summer in uh, delivering these lectures in simultaneous translation by computer. And Mr. Karnadi, a student at KIT from Indonesia, who you have seen in the videotape. So one of the victims of both the language problems that we have here, as well as the technologies that we're imposing on the students uh, who have these language problems. So thank you, first of all, for coming. We'd like to begin this podium discussion, this panel discussion, by giving each of the speakers an opportunity to introduce themselves and speak a little bit about their own role and their own relationship to language and language problems. Perhaps what we can do is we can just go from left to right in sequence. Without further ado, I ask Professor Dillmann to begin. So, good morning. Uh, my name is Rüdiger Dillmann. I'm uh, the speaker from the Institute of uh, Anthropomatics. And uh, we are studying uh, mainly how men uh, can interact with uh, different machines. I personally are interested in uh, humanoid robots and uh, in the action uh, between humans and humanoid uh, robots. Here we have, uh, in terms of language, uh, a lot of difficulties. One is to show a robot and to explain a robot uh, what has to be done, how it has to be done, then uh, to uh, interact uh, to ask the robot for example how it perceives the environment for example say what you see the other one is that the robot can also explain why it's doing something in a certain way the problem we have here is uh, that uh, it's more than transcription it's uh, language understanding it's generating representations which can be understood by both humans and the robot, so that they can uh, exchange information and that they can uh, interact. Uh, the first step has, to, has been done already, that uh, an interface between humans and uh, machines can be established, but the problem to be solved is uh, to uh, go deeper, to have in machines some kind of mental model which allows you to uh, have meaning, meaningful exchange of information and to speak meaningful, meaningful things between machines and robots. And uh, at the end, I think the robot should also be able to uh, have maybe a cultural bridge, for example, that uh, people can communicate, for example, over long distances via humanoid robots. For example, we in Karlsruhe speak German with our robot. Then the robot transmits that to a Japanese robot, for example at Waseda University, and uh, that robot can uh, translate uh, what we said in German in Japanese and also doing that what we show the robot. So this is uh, a very far a vision on cultural bridging where we have human, machine, uh, humans, maybe with cultural barriers. Thank you. Right. Has been, has been tough, huh? four hours I mean to get here from Luxembourg. <laughs> okay, my name is Roberto Cencioni, I'm the head of the unit within the large department of the European Commission, the Information Society Department, which uh, provokes, promotes, sponsors uh, research and technology work into uh, speech, 
uh, technology and natural language processing. So the Commission has been doing that since the early 80s with a number of ups and downs. The last up happened I mean, around I mean, 2008, 2009, when uh, uh, as a consequence of uh, the enlargement, as you know, I mean, quite a few I mean, new countries I mean, entered the community, uh, due to the perception that uh, there were a number of interesting I mean, uh, advances in scientific and technological terms, linked I mean, to statistical data-driven approaches and the like. Uh, due to the explosion of online content, in particular I mean, uh, social networks and the like, that was I mean, a sort of a, a, new, a new revamped the main program in the area of language uh, technology, which has yielded I mean, some nearly 60 projects, uh, totally around 150 million euro. Not much if you just consider the sheer number of uh, languages and language pairs and the sheer number of uh, people I mean, who apply and aspire I mean, uh, to uh, uh, receive some sort of financial. Now, projects, our project, just one word, I mean, uh, may be different from what most of you are used to. So we try and we have to, that's the role of the European Commission in this particular area, to stimulate the collaboration between entities uh, from different countries from different I mean, scientific technical quarters whenever possible. We try to stimulate alliances be it, I mean, within a certain project framework between uh, researchers, between uh, uh, commercial technology providers and uh, leading users. And uh, in a way, over and beyond I mean, uh, uh, scientific technical work, we try I mean, to connect the dots, i.e. create I mean, some little path taking I mean, these results I mean, towards exploitation. So making even imperfect by usable, I mean, technologies, I mean, you know, operationally and commercially used. And this is one, one of the reasons why I welcome, I mean, uh, uh, the work, the work of Professor Weibel and his collaborators, because, I mean, there is an element of uh, exploitation, whether it's, I mean, internal application, commercial, or whatever. So, uh, one obvious element for us is that we tend to uh, expect all our projects, I mean, to address multiple languages. So it's not the English plus 3% I mean of German. We try I mean, to have a more balanced I mean, coverage of various languages. Although, of course, let's recognize that the English is still, I mean, even in scientific terms, dominating largely I mean, the, the market of uh, public spending programs. And uh, just to finish off, I mean, since I'm neither a scientist nor a bureaucrat, we are now launching, I mean, another call, uh, which 30, 40 million euro available, not much again, which addresses, I mean, issues that uh, what you've been demonstrating, I mean, touch upon. Uh, the conversion between translation and speech recognition and maybe a bit of understanding. Recognition for sure. <laughs> Dialogue where possible, understanding, I mean, you know, eventually. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, um, as Alex said, I'm Jaime Carbonell, the director of the Language Technologies Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, before I say something about the technical aspects of language and translation, uh, I simply want to um, emphasize the difficulty of simultaneous interpretation. Um, I always thought it was hard, um, and then at some point I was forced to do it myself. I was in an uh, All Americas um, conference, uh, scientific conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and the guest speaker was Professor Comerauer from France. Um, the simultaneous translator never showed up. Um, and um, he was going to make his presentation in French. Um, and so you needed a translator from French to Spanish. Um, I was the closest <laughs> approximation. Uh, and so I tried. It was extremely difficult. My output was not as good as the machine to you saw today. Uh, some things I could not think fast enough uh, to translate. Um, you cannot appreciate until you do it on the spot in front of even more people <laughs> than, than uh, are here. Uh, so I really welcome the machines, so I don't have to do it again. <laughs> Maybe the other professionals are, are better than I um, at doing that. Um, let me now uh, say a few words about translation. My focus area is human-to-human -human, uh, communication via 
machine enabled by translation, primarily by clarification, by automatic summarization, by automatic search of information in other languages. Um, at uh, the Language Technologies Institute, uh, in preparation for this uh, panel, I had my uh, group of people enumerate the number of languages that we had worked on, including a large part of them in the Interact Laboratory. It was it's 55. Um, that's a tiny fraction of the 6,000 languages in the world, an even tinier fraction of the language pairs. Um, and one of the languages we have worked with is the world's southernmost language. Does anybody here know what that language is called? Um, well, it's Mapudungun. It's spoken by the Mapuche people in southern uh, part of Chile. Uh, there's no natives in Antarctica, so uh, <laughs> it cannot go further south. Um, we also worked in the world's northernmost language. Anybody know what that one is? There are two strong contenders. Uh, one is Greenlandic. Um, the other one is Anupiak. Uh, Anupiak has the settlement that is furthest north. Um, <laughs> so it, it, I suppose <laughs> that counts as the world's northernmost language. Now we're trying to figure out which is the eastern and westernmost language. We <laughs> do not know that yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, if there is an official definition, perhaps it will work on them too. Um, we are working on translation of difficult and rare languages. Uh, Mapudungun, for example, is called highly agglomerative. That means it has complex morphosyntax. Uh, one word in Mapudungun uh, maps into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words in Spanish uh, in some of these examples. Uh, Spanish and English have approximately the same number of words. German sometimes puts words together, but not, not as much as Mapudungun, not nearly as much. Uh, if you think that segmentation is difficult in German, it's, it's more difficult for some, some other languages. Um, the reason that we're doing this is that we're trying to understand the DNA uh, of all the languages in the world as much as we can. We can only sample. We don't have anywhere near the capacity to, to uh, do them all. So we're sampling African languages, native uh, North American and South American languages, European languages, and Eastern languages, of course. This is a small step towards true language uh, universal understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning. I'm, I'm very much impressed by all the scientific excellence in this room today and in this institute and worldwide. I come more from the practical side of things because I'm a human conference interpreter. Uh, I do simultaneous <laughs> interpreting in the European Parliament. I do no longer interpret myself, but I used to be. I'm a trained interpreter and I work from English, French, Spanish, Dutch and Polish into German in uh, the meetings of the European Parliament. And after being responsible for all the German interpreters in the European Parliament, I took over the unit for multilingualism support, which very much also deals with this aspect of language technology. And I'm quite impressed by what my machine colleague did this morning. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of background of the constraints we are working uh, in. First of all, the European Parliament together with the European Commission is the biggest language service worldwide. And the European Parliament is the, a real multilingual institution. And so far as all our meetings, all our meetings are interpreted in all the official languages. On a demand basis, of course. If in a meeting a certain language is not represented, we don't have interpretation which makes 23 official languages, soon with Croatian 24, just to give you an overview of the challenges uh, we're dealing with. Uh, and multilingualism in a parliament, I think, is very much the basis of democracy. You were talking about a university without barriers. Language knowledge should not be a prerequisite to learning, but language knowledge should also uh, not pose a barrier to democratic representation. So the members of the European Parliament are elected by the citizens because they represent their ideas and not because they're fluent in several foreign languages. And that's why we have to uh, offer communication and translation and interpretation to our members. Now, 
just uh, about the terminology. Translation is written translation, and that's uh, in the European institutions is very much separated from interpretation, which is oral translation, so to say. And whereas our colleagues, the translators who did written translation, are already confronted and deal on a regular basis with a computer assisted translation, they work with machine translation, they use these tools. Uh, it hasn't yet so much gone into the interpretation side of things. And that's why I'm very much interested in the results of this work. Until now, interpreters used to say, well, that's not for us. It's something that the translators can deal with because there's, of course, also a lot of resistance. People think, oh, will we soon all be replaced uh, by machines? I think one has to approach it from a different way, but I think we will uh, talk about this later. Just to give you uh, one more is, uh, idea is that we, uh, we were talking a lot about use of English this morning. Uh, the way we work in interpretation, we don't use one harp or spoke system or one language. So the aim is to provide direct interpretation in these for the moment we have 506 language combinations now with Croatian this will be multiplied so for example in a plenary session of the European Parliament the aim is to interpret all languages directly into the other languages the aim it does not work for all language combination for obvious reasons we can provide direct interpretation for the more common languages, but to find the interpreter who can interpret from Greek into Finnish, although we have one, but she cannot be in all meetings at the same time, uh, then we use a PIVO language. So Greek would first go into German, doesn't necessarily have to be English or into Spanish, and would then be interpreted into the other language. And finally, maybe to give you some idea of, of the human uh, dimensions, uh, in the European Parliament, we have roughly 400 staff interpreters. In the European Commission, there are also many more, even than 400. We work with a pool of about 2,000 freelance interpreters. And after this meeting today, I will go, travel to Strasbourg, which is not very far away, so it was convenient on the way between Brussels and Strasbourg, uh, for the plenary sessions of the European Parliament, where for one day, roughly 1,000 interpreters, staff and freelance are working to um, interpret in the different meetings. And I'm sure the English booth colleagues who have to interpret from German into English, I will tell them how difficult their work is because they keep saying German is so difficult and I keep convincing them it's not. But if I can now tell them that the machine translator has exactly the same problems as they have, they will be very much relieved, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. So my, my name is Tamim Asfur. I am um, here at KIT working on humanoid robots since 10 years. And one of the challenging or our goal is to make these robots available for humans in daily environment. And of course, communication and interaction with the robots is a very, very important challenge. Um, this is, uh, we were working with the Alex group in the last 10 years and of course on, on this topic on how to make the robots or how to provide the, ro the robots with, a na with natural uh, dialogue component where a human can act, interact with these robots uh, in the same way as humans do. Uh, and of course I participated, it was a pleasure for me to participate in the lecture translated this year with the lecture um, Rishna Organization. And from scientific point of view I see several parallelisms or interest um, from my side uh, to the natural language uh, or na uh, language technologies and speech. On the one side, um, my goal or my dream is um, to generate actions on robots from, from a limited set of um, uh, elementary actions. So this is, this is the fact how it is done in language. So we have a limited set of letters where, from which we, we can combine or build words and combine uh, or build semantically and syntactically uh, correct sentences. And the question is how to translate these uh, aspects to generate uh, complex actions of, the robot, of, of a robot. 
Um, on the other side, um, I think what a very important aspect uh, nowadays is skill transfer between different embodiments and different robots. Um, and a very important aspect, what also Professor Dillman mentioned, uh, is um, how a multicultural skill transfer can work based on the translation software or translation technologies we have nowadays. Um, and the last thing I would like to mention is the capability of, uh, or how we can uh, endow robots with the capability of um, generating semantic scene representations. So from perceptual point of view, how to use um, technologies which are, which are none and used in natural language or in translation, uh, to use that in a very um, concrete scenario where a robot has to tell a human what's on the table, uh, where is the red cup, uh, in a natural way, how to generate these natural representations based on the methodologies and techniques similar to a language. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Carl Karnadi. I'm a computer science student here in Castro Institute of Technology. Uh, and I come from Indonesia. So I'm speaking my native language, my Bahasa Indonesia, of course, and I'm speaking English quite well, but I'm speaking also German, but in a more uh, limited extent, I should say. So um, I'm here to provide some uh, perspective uh, from, from the uh, student point of view. So uh, when I came here to Germany, uh, I came here in 2006, I actually got one of the best grades in the German language examination uh, that, I has, uh, that I have to pass in order to be able to study here in Germany. So I got eins, I got one in that uh, DSH examination. But even with that good grades, that doesn't count at all when I come to the lecture hall and actually try to understand the lectures. So it's a, it's a different thing, you know. Uh, to pass uh, an exam and to understand the lectures. So I'm having a lot of difficulty to understand uh, the German lectures. Well, it could be because of, sometimes because of technical terms, sometimes because of the uh, new German words that I never heard before. And uh, sometimes it's also simply because of the way the lecturer speaking it, so the pronunciation of the lecture that is isn't clear enough for me. So then I just simply given up and uh, I often find myself in the library searching, hunting for English books or German books or any books that I can get to be able to uh, study by myself. And it's, it's a really difficult thing to do, I should say. So my grades went up and down <laughs> Uh, pretty extremely, and it's uh, not not because of the not only because of the uh, difficulty of the subject, but it's even more because uh, it it depends on how good I can understand the lecture, not depend on the subject itself. So that's yeah, that's actually picturing the difficulty that I get. So that therefore I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be here to be a part. To, be, uh, to experience a great technology that uh, will give me a second chance uh, to go back to the lecture and try to understand it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we get to the second question, and at this point I'd like to also invite uh, people from the audience or the press to ask questions. Um, raise your hand, and uh, we have microphones here. What we'd like to cover in the second question is the state of the technology. You've seen where we are now. It's been a tremendously difficult to ro road to get to where we are, and still we're all convinced and we see that it's by no means perfect. So there is still continuing work that's necessary. And so I'd like to have the panelists perhaps discuss and make an assessment of where they think we are where we're still not adequate enough, where we, sh where we are actually have made great progress, where we should be going and what kinds of new initiatives we may um, push forward f with in order to have this technology improve and 
have impact in society. So again, in this vision of Europe of the future, in one of our common dreams, I, I should say, is probably to make this language problem transparent, even though we enjoy the differences of, of our cultures and our languages. But how do we make it transparent? What kinds of aids can we use here uh, at the current state of technology? Um, if no one volunteers, I will ask uh, Professor Carbonell, since he commented already yesterday on, uh, by email on this question, perhaps to take the lead. So, um, first, let me try to paint a global picture and then go into a couple of details uh, with respect to the state of the technology in, in uh, state of language technologies. Um, there is a, a saying in the Quechua language, uh, Quechua is what they speak in the Andes region or part of the Andes region in South America. Um, I do not have the Quechua words memorized, um, but the meaning in English translates approximately as, we can see the summit, it is clear, but the path between where we are and the summit is long, it has unknown turns, um, it heads up and it heads down, and eventually it will reach there to those who persevere. Um, that, I think, is a very accurate description of language technologies. Uh, the path is long, and we cannot see all the turns uh, until we embark upon it. Um, the reason is that language, human languages present difficulties for machine um, which we, many of which we appreciate, and more of which we appreciate further as we study it. Um, for example, uh, at first it was thought that translation was just equivalent to substitution of words and phrases from one language to another. That was in the 1950s. In uh, the 1960s we realized that there was such a thing as syntax. The order of the words and phrases uh, matter uh, significantly for translation. In the 1970s, we discovered that there's such a thing as semantics. Uh, the words don't always mean the same thing. One word in one language can translate into many words in other languages. Of course, linguists and translators knew this, but the extent to which that problem really is a stumbling block for machines was not realized until we tried to reduce it to algorithms and methods that work mechanically. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, we discovered other methods, statistical machine translation, uh, interlingua-based translation, and so on. Um, all of these um, methods help us to overcome the limitations of the old and also discover some new uh, challenges. Uh, these challenges raise uh, from uh, voice recognition to uh, voice synthesis uh, to uh, mapping one language to another, to inferring the meaning of language so that we can communicate to the robot and it does what we mean, not necessarily what we say, um, uh, which uh, enables misinterpretation. And we understand what the robots tell us uh, about how they perceive the world or the situation uh, in a way that that explanation is clear and we can take action uh, based on it. Um, I am not going to enumerate the specifics of the current technical uh, challenges that we're dealing with, but you can imagine what some of them are. When we're dealing with uh, rare languages, I mentioned already the very complex uh, um, morphology. Uh, also, when you're dealing with rare languages, you have less data. Uh, you don't have large amounts of pre-translated text that you can apply standard statistical algorithms too. You have to combine statistics with other forms of uh, structural machine learning with forms of linguistic analysis, um, and you still don't get it quite right, uh, to say the least. Um, so the, the state is in flux, uh, and the summit is clear. The summit is essentially to have machines that can be true uh, interpreters and um, translators and understanding uh, of the human languages. We have not seen yet all the turns in the path. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Right. Uh, from the standpoint of a, of a sponsor, 
Uh, just, I mean, a few disparate bits and pieces. I mean, I'm not going to mean to comment on, on, on science. Uh, throughout the 90s, the level of um, public investment in Europe was uh, on a par with US federal agencies, at least, I mean, the white offices, I mean, not other, other environments I mean, in and around uh, Washington. Today, uh, I estimate that uh, uh, this particular field, a large language and, and uh, speech, has lost 50% of uh, the then current level of public funding throughout Europe. Uh, Europe is uh, struggling, okay? And, uh, you know, Germany is in a much better state than other countries, and yet, uh, as, as a body, as an entity, we are struggling. I'm not saying we are sinking, that may happen, but right now we're struggling. Which means that uh, uh, politicians and businesses and citizens alike do need, I mean, practical, usable results, okay? And although I agree with all the statements that have been made so far, I suggest that uh, the scientific community, private and public, because there are a number of public labs as well, should find ways, I mean, to try and deliver things which are uh, slightly more usable. There are many components in place. There are many modules everywhere, okay? But uh, one of the problems of this field is that, I mean, when it is research, it has got a name, it has speech on natural language processing. When it's a sort of solved, I mean, it's embodied within a larger I mean, application, a larger component, and therefore disappears, right? So, uh, so the, the success stories, I mean, um, don't carry the name. You're never recognized, I mean, as a successful inventor or developer. So that's one of the things. This affects, a number of things, affects public investors, uh, private uh, uh, companies, because, I mean, uh, uh, what you do is not the Garner category. I mean, there is no software category uh, for processing human language. And therefore, I mean, if I need I mean, to invest I mean, 50 or 500 million dollars, I don't know how to, how to compare. Uh, how you perform, how you score, I mean, how to compare your technology results, I mean, to others. So that's uh, putting a face, an identity, a bit of branding, I mean, can only help. The other element is, uh, in Europe, uh, too many teams are too small and therefore necessarily have a limited ambition. I think that there should be ways, I mean, to try and concentrate at a certain level, at least, when it comes, I mean, to multi-party, cross-national collaborations, to sort of concentrate efforts on a few, a few objectives, and to struggle until when, I mean, that you crack them in the problem, or at least, I mean, you know, the next big breakthrough. Uh, there is a lot of local research, which is, so to say, publication-driven, uh, which uh, doesn't scale up, I mean, and doesn't offer, I mean, a, a pathway towards, I mean, you know, more engineering, more business, more application-related developments. And thirdly, although the technology may be mature in many areas, in many respects, I think one of the conditions, I mean, and this is one of the things we have been trying very modestly to do the last few years, is to connect the dots. Uh, in other terms, I mean, create a market pool. In other terms, I mean, try and understand the path or the pathway from the lab through uh, engineering of a piece of technology to actually building in, uh, uh, integrating the technology within a product to actually deploying the product, okay? Because that's the only pool which matters at the end of the day, okay? Mm -hmm. So making it useful, applied, and, and deployed. And that we don't have yet, I mean, for many d domains, segments of this field. We do have, I mean, of course, for some. And the danger I see over the last few years is uh, industry consolidation. If we wait any longer, there are already a number of uh, megaliths, and you know them all. Uh, but even, I mean, at the lower level of small corporations, I mean, there is a sort of a bar to exercise, I mean, going on. And if we wait any longer, at the end of the day, we'll be left with research and no access whatsoever to the market. Ours and the worldwide global market. So um, what I'm calling for is the fact that computers can transform information I mean, I fed my family very successfully thanks to, to you know, informatics. It was basically, I mean, you get out of what you put in for 30 years. 
It's only last, what, 20 years maybe that we've seen. I mean, software actually understanding, interpreting, doing things, transforming, I mean, I think, I mean, more than just, I mean, the representation, I mean, the substance of it. So the fact that the technology is mature, I think, is understandable. Mm. What uh, uh, makes the difference and can, you know, just trigger either success or failure is, I believe, I mean, trying and promote, I mean, some sort of ecosystem whereby researchers, technologists, and also business-oriented people, I mean, work together, understand each other, is a dialogue, and then you can build, I mean, uh, you know, access to market and uh, create opportunities for more and more ambitious research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I couldn't agree more with that comment because we're obviously passionate in this environment to turn basic science into something that people get to use. And uh, as I know, many of the team will, will attest to, it's not only painful, it's actually an order of magnitude harder than just to do a prototype. And um, it's also sometimes difficult to do at a university uh, yeah. because it doesn't necessarily immediately, some aspects of it doesn't necessarily immediately lead to publications, but is nevertheless a key component of actually making the technology useful and happen. So the, the same applies, I mean, to commercial technology developers in this field. And I understand that, I mean, uh, it's not me, I'm, most of the time I quote more <laughs> respectable, I mean, and influential uh, characters. It's largely uh, due to the fact that uh, the valuation of uh, uh, technology companies in Europe uh, is much lower than in the States. So basically, I mean, going around and shopping technology, I mean, in Europe, is a very good I mean, proposition for even relatively small U.S. groups. I mean, I say U.S. tomorrow may be Chinese or another one. So one of the questions is basically our technology costs a lot, I mean, to develop, but it's very cheap to buy, you see, if you see what I mean. Now, since we cannot go, I mean, to Frankfurt and uh, triple, I mean, <laughs> the valuation of all the companies, uh, but there is an element, how do we actually add value to the technology which has, you know, taken so long to mature? Mm. I mean, how, how do you put, I mean, a price on it, okay? Mm. Which cannot be the cost, I mean, it's a different element, right? Mm. Right. Okay, I give uh, a, a short... Um History on uh, speech interfaces to machines. Uh, in the early 80s, we had the first uh, single word spoken recognizers, which did allow to program a robot uh, saying stop, uh, move a joint number three to the left. And uh, I think about 200, uh, more than 250 words could be uh, recognized, but it was individual, uh, single word. So in the 90s, there has been a development towards a continuous speech with a simple descriptive sentences on two machines, describing objects, maybe to have some. Um, then um, uh, in the 90s was a strong development on image processing to describe what is on the image, and this can be translated to speech so that uh, the approach of say what you see uh, is one thing where uh, speech technology is to be applied. This means objects, moving objects, relations. And on the other side, uh, there is uh, the um, other development where uh, spoken speech has to be translated into representation. We found out that in robotics, for example, to explain a robot how to do it, currently we do that with a camera and we show uh, a, a, a task. And this is uh, processed by the computer, then segmented, and the program is generated. But we found out that uh, language is very important to explain, uh, to show, but also to explain why to do for what it's necessary to be careful what has to be observed and what has to be done in which uh, uh, situation. This is work is about 2000, 2005, the first works came out. And uh, then in the last years, there is uh, uh, increasing interest on haptics and contact and forces. So if you do assemblies or if you do uh, interaction, uh, we can detect additional sensors to touch 
uh, to uh, derive forces, and this has, can also be uh, translated into words. For example, uh, if you attach to an object, it's, it's a plane, it's a sphere, or some features, there's a hole, or um, uh, operating with a tool. And uh, uh, since uh, 2010, uh, it's an increasing uh, activity where uh, semantics on interaction uh, is uh, discussed so that uh, situations and the meaning of uh, what is observed and what is demonstrated can be represented. The problem is to go up from signals, from actuator signals to symbolic representation and then to abstract levels and then we are at a speech level and the other one is going back from the symbolic level, from speech, from demonstration to the actuator and the signal. The problem is how to speak with a controller, with a control loop. If you say do something careful, uh, you need some parameters, you need some sensing, some observations, and this has to be translated, only to give some uh, example. I think a very big challenge is human-robot-human uh, uh, -human, uh, interaction. One is for translation, one is for telepresence, to, have, uh, uh, to do, uh, uh, perform activities. In the past, in the Gulf of Mexico, or in a nuclear disaster scenario of the, uh, very, uh, uh, of the past, uh, we have seen that it's very important to be present in dangerous environment. This is a core activity for robots and to interact uh, directly with the scenario in both directions, which is uh, necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will not comment on, on the details of the technological development, which I think is very impressive. <coughs> But maybe one thing what I, that I also mentioned in the beginning and that I found uh, very interesting in your presentation, Professor Weiber, was that um, the, starting from speech recognition to the actual translation process, that the machine deals exactly with the same problems, obviously, as human interpreters and translators would. And I, I think uh, seeing how speech, uh, speech recognition is progressing, I think it's quite comforting. But what are the challenges in an environment like, like the European Parliament, for example, or any discussion forum is, of course, that uh, our members speak freely, fast, they mumble, they have very different accents. Would the machine recognize Irish, Scottish, American, English, uh, or not, let alone some of the German regional <laughs> variations? Uh, so these are challenges. Um, but also the... the the first stage, speech recognition, could also be very interesting in our context. For example, when we do testing of interpreters, um, we of course make the interpreters interpret the speech in a testing environment and then afterwards uh, the selection board needs to, did he actually say this, did she say that? And if you would have a nice speech recognition on, on our computer and we could then follow what the interpreter said, uh, that would also be interesting for testing and examinations of interpreters. And then one, one difference is, of course, that we cannot rework, uh, whereas our translate colleagues in translation, they get the machine translation and they can work and revise and change it. Whereas in interpretation, the product is, of course, simultaneous and instantaneous. And uh, we would like to rework sometimes what we said, because it's now web streamed live, the plenary session. And uh, as we are not machines, we make mistakes and human errors. And sometimes we would like to rework. So this is, uh, this is maybe an interesting idea of how you, how you could work with that. And then, of course, uh, all the technical development which is going on and which is very exciting also leads to high expectations from our users. Because, of course, members of parliament now, if they have to wait two weeks for a document to be translated, they get very impatient and they say, well, just put it through Google Translate and we get it soon. And also for interpretation, it, it, it leads to um, expectations and I think it's very important to inform about the realistic possibilities as they are now, what would be possible in the future, and also to stay in the loop and uh, follow what is going on. Okay, I can also say something from robotics point of view. I think we would love to have these perfect systems, recognition and dialogue systems for robotics because this will really uh, push the, uh, the, the field uh, of service robotics or human-centered robotics 
very, very much, yeah. not only uh, in the form of robots which are operating in a kitchen or daily environment, but in all applications, so medical applications, robot uh, assistance systems for surgery, for example, and others. But unfortunately, from my own experience, not only with the software from Carlsruhe, but from the other groups working on building natural dialogue systems for robots, all the systems are still very, or dialogue systems which are presented by the community or by the robotic community are well designed uh, so that um, somebody can perform a demonstration which is nice, but they cannot deal with noisy environments with different, uh, with different speakers. And I think these challenges are, uh, have, been, have been addressed by, by the previous um, uh, colleagues here. So uh, from my point of view, I think the robustness of the systems is very, very important. Yeah? So, um, and uh, the flexibility to really talk with the system, a robot or an iPhone or a, I don't know what, um, about, about um, very, very simple things. Yes, yeah? just to perform a small talk with your robot and where you have a system which really can, can answer your questions. How, how was the match yesterday between Italy and Spain, for example, and uh, did, you went to, uh, did you go to the beer garden after that? And not only these well-designed and structured uh, dialogues um, where more or less everybody is expecting what, uh, what, the, what you can talk, or how you can talk to your robot or to your system to get the best result. So I think robustness and having systems which can deal with different aspects, noisy uh, environments, um, different speakers, of course, different languages, uh, and so on, is a very challenging and important issue. OK. So it's kind of hard to follow those high quality speeches from the other speakers. <laughs> So um, I'm probably will um, provide a little bit of um, positive note on, especially on the lecture translator system and the and the lectures. Um, so when I come to the lectures, well, I I saw this. Uh, many of my friends, the foreign students, has this, you know, little devices, a little bit uh, the electronic translation devices, a little bit uh, similar to calculator, where when you type something, you type some German words, and you get the translation your, uh, in the language that you chose. So um, then I think, well, would it be nice if we have a, a, a hands-free automatic translation, you know, without the need of uh, typing anything to it? And, but that is actually exactly what this lecture translator technology is. You know. This is a, a hands-free. You don't need to type anything. You don't even need to buy a new device because it's online, it's already it could accessible in the laptop and tablet. It's pretty cool, I would say. So I'm, I'm sure there, there are still a lot of room, uh, rooms for improvement. There are still a lot of challenges uh, to fix. But even in the current state, I think it's far, far better than those ugly electronic translation devices or it's better than none obviously mm. so yeah yeah thank you very much perhaps i might add one comment since the question was raised you know how to deal with accent and spontaneous speakers and so on it's perhaps surprising that some of the things aren't so much of a problem at all while others are huge problems and some of them are counterintuitive and some of them agree with the human experience. So some of the counterintuitive things are that accents turn out not to be a big problem for us. We have adaptation algorithms. Classic example is our colleague Asfur, who, who can pronounce the umlauts very well in German. So, so we had this in a big Audi Max lecture hall in, uh, here in Karlsruhe. Maybe some of the students here attended that lecture where he said the word that gives him the most trouble, which I showed, is Würfelkalkül, because it has two umlauts and it's a complicated word. And it recognized it fine. And so there was a thundering applause in the audience that it could ha handle 
uh, Tamim Asfour's pronunciation of Würfel Kalkul. But if you think about it, what it does is it learns very quickly that there's a transformation between the typical accents and the original speaker, and it adapts, and it does a reasonably good job. Two other problems, though, that are really difficult is this mumbling that you mentioned. Mumbling is something that the machines agree with humans is very, very difficult. When people mumble and stutter, and some of our colleagues do that too, uh, it is very hard to transcribe and even harder to translate. Because if you see the transcript of a mumbled lecture, a stuttered lecture, it's even when you read it in the original language very hard to follow. So converting things in understandable, readable text, I think, is a big challenge. And then in the order, in the range of hard to understand challenges that are impossibly difficult, you all see us here with close speaking microphones, and there's a good reason for it. If you put microphones at a distance, it's still an open challenge that no one can address with computer systems because the echoes and uh, noises, etc., are actually a ge uh, genuine problem. And so the comment on robustness is well taken because I think that's, to me, an area that still requires a lot of work to get these things robustly. So spontaneous speech, noisy environments, they're all challenges that still are open to be taken. Um, I have one question. A good lecture is an uh, interactive lecture. So uh, one is to have a monologue mm. and you train the machine, but the other one is to have questions with uh, students, to have a dialogue which is not uh, uh, predictable what right. happens. Can you say something to that? Yeah, it's, it's not a problem if the responses are, again, sensible sentences. I can show you recordings of telephone conversations or meetings between people that are so fragmentary that they're not intelligible even if you read them perfectly transcribed in the original language. Because very often, as humans, we, it's like a ping pong game. We say a little fragment and the other person adds another fragment and so on, and we con reconstruct the meaning of it without it ever having been said. And that remains a big problem. So really open, fast exchange and so on is troublesome. Now, the typical lecture interaction when there's a question from someone in the room and the lecturer responds tends not to be a problem because then again you get full sentences by and large. So I think for lectures I'm pretty sanguine and pretty optimistic. I think what's still a challenge is when it's really a fast exchange in a seminar, let's say. So seminars will still concern us in moving forward because there you have a lot of interactive exchange, which is also important, of course, for foreign students. But let me move to the third question in the interest of time. We have the last one, which, which might interest many of you, is what's the symbiosis between machine and humans? Ultimately, we're here to build a tool to help people do another task. It's, technology here is a, is a means to an end. And so we also don't want to replace humans. It would be foolish. It's going to be always a work together. And all successful technologies in the history of humankind have been technologies where ultimately it's been a collaboration between humans and machines. So I'd like to have the com uh, panelists maybe comment on how they see technology gradually moving into their environments and how they see the, the combination or interaction between human services and machine services to play out. So give us a, a view of your uh, predictions of the future. Maybe I can ask as a fir for the, uh, the fir for Frau Altenberg perhaps to comment first since she is in intimately involved in that question. I think one, one important aspect of, of this is um, to um, to ease this uh, fear that some of the human language um, workers, be it translators or interpreters, have uh, that they will all be replaced by a machine. I think for translation it's working well now because there is an excellent cooperation, as I said. They use computer-assisted tools. There is machine translation that sometimes is then reworked. 
and especially all the translation memories that are extremely useful. I think none of the translators would want to go back to the pencil and piece of paper method of the past, let alone all the terminology work and uh, terminology extraction that can be done uh, with the assistance of a computer. Now for interpreters there, uh, the situation is of course different and I think the first step is really to inform also the human interpreter about advances in technology and that it still has to be seen how this can help them with their work, apart from all the meeting preparation work, where this is of course helpful. Um, but also, um, whereas in a big, as I said, parliamentary environment like a plenary session or committee meeting with political discussions, I suppose uh, probably, uh, I'm not sure, but in my lifetime, I think the, in, the human interpreters will not be replaced there, but there are also other ways when, for example, the, the members of the European Parliament go on, on delegations, on missions, and they can be ill like any other citizen, and the interpreter is not always available. And as you said, um, although the humans are still better, it's maybe better than having no translation or interpretation at all. So I think, but, but what I, I still see is how, or what is not entirely clear to me now is how could this really, or how we can make this interact with the human interpreter. I think, as I said, for the translator, it's quite clear how this works, but as we have no possibility afterwards to rework the output, um, how can this work? And maybe first in a bilingual setting, of course, uh, before starting to look at, at huge uh, multilingual meetings, which have, of course, other challenges. Mm. Thank you. All right. So, before addressing the symbiosis, let me make a connection between robustness and the symbiosis. Um, tell you briefly about a system at Carnegie Mellon called Let's Go. Uh, Let's Go is a dialogue uh, speech recognition system to help people um, figure out bus routes. Um, it's a very simple task. How do I get from X to Y? When does the bus come? Do I need to change buses? Uh, and so forth. So you make the simplification by task, um, but you make it completely open-ended otherwise. People call with trucks driving by, with a kid demanding mommy's attention, and mommy's trying to find out about the bus, and the kid wants something else. I'd like to go home uh, without realizing that the bus is the way you're going to get home. Um, and the problems there are not, as Alex already said, are not different accents. In the US, we have the equivalent of uh, uh, the Bavarisch here, or Schweizerdeutsch, or I should say Schweizerdeutsch, uh, I suppose. Uh, that problem is not a hard one. The hard one is threefold, is the background uh, other uh, noise. It is the fact that the humans do not provide sufficient information. I want the bus to go home. Okay, well, where do you live? <laughs> um, you have to engage in a dialogue in order to extract enough <coughs> information to carry the dialogue. Sometimes the extraction of information is because you did not hear clearly um, what, the, what the other person said. Building these systems, even for simple applications, is hard. Um, at 5 o'clock p.m., it switched the system from the human to the machine because Pittsburgh did not have enough money to pay humans to man the telephones after 5 p.m. And people were very upset because the quality of the machine help was not the same as the quality of the human help. They wanted to talk to a human. A year later, they still wanted to talk to a human. The system had gotten somewhat better. Two years later, the requests to talk to a human were fewer. Either people got used to it or the system got better. We did not know which one. Four years after it was installed, we had the first time somebody uh, who called at 3 p.m. while well, there was still a human. The human had some trouble understanding what the person wanted. The person said, I want to talk to the robot. <laughs> we had one more uh, example of the request to talk to the robot. So maybe, maybe it's, getting, uh, it's getting there. So come back to the larger picture um, of this uh, symbiosis. Um, I don't think symbiosis is necessarily the correct word. 
because the machines will always be in service of the humans uh, rather than the other way around. Uh, a, a word processor and a human are not exactly in a symbiotic relationship. An automobile and a human are also not exactly. Um, these are extremely useful mechanical or electronic devices. I think most of language technologies will be the same way. It will translate, it will provide a service. Uh, the quality of that service will improve. It will make people more efficient. It will lower costs overall. It will make society better. But it won't never really be a true symbiosis, in my opinion. Roberto? Uh, orthogonal, but maybe restating, I mean, one or two concepts that you have just uh, heard. Um, first, I mean, I think it's a well known fact that uh, the most successful, the usually successful applications <coughs> cannot be predicted. Yeah? And texting is one such thing about there being many more. So, so number one, I mean, this leads to me to, I believe very much in interaction between machines, software, and humans. And I would define it as almost a form of respect. When you develop a piece of software, which is what I've done for more than 20 years, we treat basically I mean, users like nuisance, okay? They are the robots. Software is the real thing, I mean, okay? And uh, I've got, I think, six Android smartphones, right? Like this, from one and the same maker. And the most irritating thing in life is when, I mean, I use it, I mean, to type in text in French, Italian, and English, mostly in English, and it keeps, I mean, changing my words, which are perfectly okay. So, because it can't make, I mean, you know, it cannot digest, I mean, some English words, and of course, I mean, it refuses to learn, I mean, French and Italian, I mean, expressions. So, I think, I mean, there must be a software engineer somewhere between Taiwan and California, who should be taught <laughs> to show ways of respecting, I mean, the user's intentions. I think this is deeper than it sounds. Third element, most of you, all of you, I hope, I mean, are aware of Moses, which is, I mean, the, the text machine relation, I mean, system, which was partly or largely developed, I mean, thanks to European funding. Now, uh, what you can't possibly know is that since then, the last three, four years, all the projects we're putting money into are about, I mean, putting it to work. It's on use of uh, SMT. It basically, I mean, by combining two MT engines, by putting TM next to MT, by doing MT and post-editing, by looking at the iris, I mean, of an editor, I mean, to guess, I mean, <laughs> the, the intention, I mean, the purpose and the stress. So there is, and there should be more research on actual use of technology than there is, I mean, in, in certain, I mean, uh, corners. So, I repeat, when you design, I mean, your software, I mean, just bear in mind that there is, a, on average, intelligent person, I mean, sitting in front of the screen, the phone, or whatever, try, I mean, to gather, I mean, the intentions or respect them. Number two, don't try, I mean, to predict, I mean, what will happen, I mean, to your software because it will fail. Uh, WhatsApp, I mean, was designed by two guys. I mean, Viper, I mean, is becoming usually successful. It's no bigger than that. So, I mean, there are small and little things that, that I mean, change, I mean, everybody's life. Uh, thirdly, uh, user-related research is, by now, today, as important as, you know, hardcore, I mean, technology-based research. I think, I mean, we live in a world where we need, I mean, to combine technological innovation and innovation in the way, I mean, we use, I mean, these things, I mean, and how we co-evolve with these things, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. Some uh, additional uh, situation on service. Um, there are uh, noisy and, and, and fuzzy uh, requests for service. For example, if a person says, help me, uh, humans very immediately uh, negotiate and know how to help and I make a decision and I can help you or you. If you have a machine, a robot, and you ask help me, a uh, long discourse, discussion, uh, dialogue has to be started. So uh, to look to such situation, I think it's important, uh, of course, to know more about the people, maybe the preferences, maybe to recognize intention of the person, maybe the discourse if we are on a railway station, on an airport, in the supermarket, or at home, or if it's a handicapped person at home. And I think there is a language body necessary to describe 
the environment and what may happen, what are typical situations in that environment and coming back to robustness. I think the best way to be, uh, go towards robust systems is to make the discourse small and uh, very clear and then I think this uh, fuzzy situation, for example, help me or support and, or give me some information. Of course, there are cognitive capabilities necessary, but again, I think uh, to use language technology, also gesture is important, maybe body language, maybe uh, emotion, I'm not, if this is possible. And uh, more important is the intention to recognize that. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, perhaps just to interject one, uh, insert one comment. Of course, with lectures, we're at the opposite extreme of limiting domains. We, we, that's the absolute opposite extreme where the topic can be anything and it's very specialized in that domain, in that topic, right? So that's in, but the robustness issue and the practical issue and the usability issue is just the same in the sense that we need to then think about how do we, does it scale? How do we quickly insert it in that particular situation and ma make it automatically adapt? So I think that's a gigantic challenge of, in fact, handling such broad domain uh, problems. Um, I have a uh, question uh, to uh, Dr. Cencioni. Um, the, uh, what we discussed actually is that there is one side speech, on the other side there is vision, on the third is, is uh, robotics, haptics, but then also cognitive science. Uh, I have the feeling that in a lot of programs these uh, domains are separated. And uh, to have there maybe a challenge towards the future, I think it's important to build bridges between the communities. Um, starting from representation and then grounding that to sense as to actuators and uh, to speech. Um, do you have any idea? Are there programs coming up? So, number one, I mean, it's, uh, it's happening. It has been happening for some time already. Uh, and in any case, I mean, we as commission, as a sponsor, I mean, of this type of research, we are going multimodal. Okay, so I don't expect to see speech-only mean projects in the in the coming months and years. Number one, number two, uh, we as commission, after extensive I mean uh, consultations, discussions, experts, and the like, we publish a work program. Then we get it out in the wild, and you people, I mean, you come back with your project idea. So. Uh, Right or wrongly, I've come to the decision, I mean, in my little mind, that uh, uh, a public spending program uh, addressing also speech has basically, I mean, uh, uh, one priority which is dialogue and maybe a sub-priority which is open domain. All the rest, I mean, is gladly done by many people in many different ways, I mean, uh, left, right and center. So we ask, I mean, for, with a number of features and qualifiers, we ask for dialogue. And we get sophisticated command and control systems, we get, I mean, speech recognition, noisy environment, this and that, and so forth. We get acoustics. We get, I mean, uh, lots of transcription, and, uh, and some of them coupled with the translation. So many things, all equally respectable, useful, and indeed necessary. Everything but dialogue. So just to show that, you know, you can, I mean, try and pull and push and, you know, set a certain agenda, but at the end of the day, the ball is very much in your camp. Third comment. Uh, I'm old enough, I mean, uh, uh, to have seen, I mean, uh, three main phases in uh, community programs, research programs. The first phase was basically, I mean, multinational. Get together, do whatever you want, but do it on, on, on a multinational basis. And that was, I mean, the 80s. Sometime, I mean, in the course of the 90s, probably around the mid-90s, we, we uh, bumped into ah, uh, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches. We want people to get together and basically combine, I mean, advances, thoughts, approaches from different disciplines. And that's been, I mean, the big news, I mean, for 10 years. Now, I believe that the Commission, in its future programs, I mean, is uh, moving towards what I call uh, uh, address the network failure, build a value chain, and look at all the players and sectors and stakeholders that will make that research successful 
in the, you know, in the real sense of the word. So basically, I mean, from research through, I mean, uh, technology engineering to transfer to early deployment through use partners and so on and so forth until when they say, okay, now it's all yours, I mean, you know, make money out of it. So from countries through disciplines to the various players in the, in the value chain, which again, I guess, in the same direction. So the answer is yes. I don't think there would be at the European level uh, any programs and possibly not even projects exclusively centered on speech. It would be speech with all these affective, cognitive, uh, multimodal, visual, optic, and so sort of element that you mentioned, okay? Because that's the only way, I mean, to make them work eventually. It may be seen as a fuit en avant, so you, you can't even, I mean, recognize an normal speech. You want to build this complex, I mean, factory, and it is a fuit en avant, but on the other hand, I mean, it's the only recipe, I mean, to get somewhere one day, okay? So that's happening, it will happen even more. So there will be necessarily this regrouping, I mean, of people, ideas, uh, protocols, and the like. So, if, if you ever have a chance to tell this to our American funding colleagues, <laughs> Uh, please do. Uh, it's been very difficult to get the cognitive, the dialogue, uh, the multimedia, the speech funded together into a program that truly integrates it. The PAL program at DARPA was an exception. That one was successful. It led to Siri, for example, as an application. But that was an exception. That was the only one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, clearly, there's need for more. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Tanim and Carl Kanadi, very quick okay, final okay. comment. Um, very, very brief comment. So um, for me, it was a pleasure to participate in the lecture translator with, with this uh, lecture with a huge number of students. As you, you noticed, they didn't listen to me. They followed the translation uh, on the screen, your translation. So it was a great experience. Uh, and I think really we need we need these technology. And, this and this will be a serv service for everybody worldwide. I believe we can um, enhance the capabilities of our mobile devices and computers by by such uh, translation capabilities where one could select whether he prefer to listen to the speaker with the accent or would prefer to listen to another German speaker or to an English or French speaker. So um, I think this is um, a great achievement um, and uh, which must be continued in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Also uh, very short remarks. So um, one of the question that pops out would be, uh, will it be an Will language technology be an obstacle for uh, learning a new language? <coughs> and I think the, the answer would be no, because uh, one thing about learning a new language, uh, the, the, the biggest obstacle is when you have a frustrating moments. And uh, I think language technology has a huge potential to uh, smoothen the uh, learning curve in learning new uh, languages, so it won't be a problem. And secondly, the, uh, what I think is the, one of the most important purpose of this technology would be uh, how to attract uh, foreign students to come to Germany, right? <laughs> As you have presented in your presentation. So um, yeah, of course, they will come, and uh, just hearing about it will attract them. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> Uh, one thing, we're, we're here talking about uh, technical stuff, talking about technology, we sometimes forget that uh, this uh, lecture translator technology is more than just a technology, you know. It's a technology that shows care. It, uh, it shows a special care, special attention to us, foreign students. Uh, the whole system built to accommodate our needs, to accommodate, uh, to help us to uh, solve our problems. So um, I see it as a special gift to us, the foreign students, and uh, I'm very, very thankful for the team and to the country, Germany, that will come us and make uh, the whole thing uh, possible. So thank you. <laughs>